Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, officers of the Star Fleet, Jedis, Klingons, everybody. Uh, I've been asked to tell you about something very, very old, which is curious because I understand you are all here on the conference to talk about new things, new technologies, new uh, paradigms, uh, <coughs> new things in, a, in any way. I'm going, however, to talk to you about something that uh, was born, was used many, many years ago, 50 years ago to be exact, uh, which means that uh, it is older than most of you, if not all. It is not older than me, which means that somehow I am rather old, but well, this is it. Uh, in mid-1961, as, as most of you are aware, uh, the United States, NASA, embarked on a bold endeavor which was to send, uh, on the words of President Kennedy, send a man to the moon and take him back safely before the end of the decade, of that decade, of course. NASA, to accomplish this uh, order, this uh, order, had three possible ways of doing it. The first one was what uh, was called direct ascent. Basically, Essentially, you put your craft on a big enough rocket, turn it on, send it to the moon, land it, well, turn it around, break, uh, land on the moon, and then came back, which, is, which was the preferred way of doing uh, of the Hollywood uh, makers uh, then, and of the comic artists such as Hergé. Hergé uh, pro proposed exactly this same theory with his Tintin, uh, adventure in the moon about uh, 10 years before NASA was born. The second, uh, well, the, the, um, this is how the spacecraft to be used would, would have looked. As you can see, there is a big fuel tank down there with the engines in order to break the, the descent to the moon to uh, make it soft. And later there was a smaller but equally uh, heavy spacecraft upstairs with its own fuel uh, contents, fuel depot, and its engines. That was a, a pretty good idea, it would have worked, except for one small detail, that it was so heavy that it needed such a big, such a huge rocket, Nova was called, was never built that uh, this rocket was not only outside the 60s technology, but it is even outside today's technology. So somehow this approach had to be scrapped. The second one was called Earth Orbit Rendezvous. It, uh, it uh, was, sim was similar to the, um, the direct ascent except that the idea was to send two, one small craft, smaller craft, not much smaller really, into uh, Earth orbit, send then a second rocket loaded with fuel, transfer the fuel to the uh, spacecraft, and once you had a big enough, um, a big enough uh, in the sense of heavy enough uh, capsule, send it to the moon in a pretty much the same way as the direct ascent was uh, thought. This was the preferred, by the way, this was the preferred option for uh, Werner von Braun, uh, not because he liked it especially, but because it, se it seems that he considered that it would be necessary to build kind of a small uh, space station around the Earth, which could be used later for other projects in which he was very, very, were uh, his dreams really, not only going to the moon, but also going to Mars. Uh, but, however, there was a gentleman uh, in, um, 
in the, um, the, the Langley Research Center, NASA's center, called John Hubold. This is the one who had a different idea. Hubold was campaigned um, for many years about a third possibility, the idea of lunar or orbit rendezvous. The idea was to send two different crafts into the moon, one big enough for three people, another one small enough to take two of these people, land on the moon, but with a minimum of equipment, while the main craft waited in lunar orbit. The, the idea was pretty much this. Uh, the same way that the big cruise ships never or rarely uh, dock uh, on the harbor, but rather they stay out of the, of the harbor and use the small skiffs to take the crew or the tourists or whatever to land, leave them there, pick them up, and take them back to the, to the main cruise. That was basically the idea. It took him quite a lot of work, a lot of persuasion, many times going up, up in the scale at NASA, until finally, Von Braun gave up and recognized the advantages of using lunar orbit rendezvous. Just to give you an idea, you can see the difference between the direct ascent or the Earth orbit rendezvous, the size of the craft that should be used, compared to the small, very small uh, vehicle for landing on the moon, which was later called the lunar module. Uh, to perform this type of uh, plan, there were, there were several difficulties. One of them was that the craft, the main craft, should be able to perform a lot of complicated maneuvers around the moon, including the docking uh, rendezvous and, and docking with another uh, craft, while the craft was flying over the hidden side of the moon, which means that he was, it was outside uh, the tracking of the Earth station. In other words, it had to be autonomous, and that's uh, completely autonomous to perform quite complicated uh, maneuvers that at that moment, in the mid-61s, had never had even attempt in Earth orbit. Uh, this was the, the idea, and this was the reason, one of the reasons at least, for which the Apollo uh, craft, Apollo spacecraft, needed a computer on board. The calculations were so complicated, so complex, for all the uh, space navigation that uh, just couldn't be done visually or by hand by the astronauts. So finally, after many iterations, this is how the Apollo spacecraft looked. Probably many, if not most of you, are familiar with it, but anyhow, uh, the command module was the only part of the uh, craft that came back to the Earth. All the other uh, components were lost one time or another. Behind the command module was the service module with all the consumables, uh, uh, power generation, oxygen, etc. And a big uh, engine, uh, you can see it right there behind it, which would be used for making the uh, necessary trajectory corrections and especially for breaking the, the trajectory of the craft when arriving to the moon and forcing it to enter lunar orbit. And later on, even more critical than that, to start the engine again and go back uh, to the Earth. NASA was very, from the beginning, was very, very aware of the need of a computer on board. So aware that the computer that would fit in the common module was the first item to be contracted, to be ordered by NASA, even before the builder of the main craft was decided. 
the, um, the uh, commitment of Kennedy was made in May 1961. As you can see, perhaps you can read it, this uh, telegram, which was the official order for the computer, is uh, dated in August, less than three months after the whole Apollo program was started. This telegram, <coughs> excuse me, this telegram uh, was an order sent to the instrument lab, which was a department of uh, MIT, headed by Charles Draper, which is this gentleman here. Uh, Draper was a legend uh, already then in its own right, uh, having invented uh, the first inertial autopilot for airplanes and having worked also on the uh, Polaris uh, guidance, uh, missile guidance. Uh, in fact, the fact that the, that the instrument laboratory had some experience in, in, with the Polaris was also one of the main reasons for which uh, the order went to them, which was kind of a surprise because the uh, instrument laboratory was an academic institution, not an industrial one. Uh, everybody expected to, the order to go to somebody like uh, IBM or uh, Boeing or Rockwell or whatever, and it went to uh, something that was more a university department than an industry. This is how the original specs for the uh, Apollo computer, or Apollo, rather than Apollo computer, the Apollo guidance and navigation system. You can see that the main, main uh, place is taken by an uh, inertial unit, and an inertial unit, of course, you know, is a set of uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers that provide a fixed reference uh, in, uh, in any uh, situation. It doesn't matter how the craft moves, the inertial platform always keeps its, uh, its uh, orientation regarding to the absolute space, in this case, the stars and the, and the heavens. But on the top of it, there was some uh, optical equipment needed to take readings of uh, stars in the classical uh, navigation uh, or in the classical way that most navigators have done for centuries. And it was needed also for calibrating, properly calibrating the inertial platform. All the rest for the moment were just black boxes. And by the way, uh, uh, here on the right you see the specs, in uh, the, the physical specs of the instrument, of the computer. In a time that um, most computers occupied whole rooms, and drank uh, kilowatts and kilowatts, uh, needed a special equipment, air conditioning equipment to keep them cool. Uh, this was almost a science fiction uh, proposal. Uh, many people recognized that they, had they known all the difficulties that were expecting them, uh, they wouldn't have taken the order. The Yes, navigation system would be installed right there, down, down where you see the astronaut standing. Uh, but there will be another uh, unit on the commander's coach, uh, in front of the commander's coach. I mean, that meant that the commander or the pilot should be able to control the computer because the computer was supposed to control everything from uh, keeping the orientation of the uh, reference system to uh, starting the engine and stopping the engine at the right time and so on. And the other position, the one down there, uh, right where the computer would be located, was to allow the navigator to use the optical systems, in this case a sextant and a telescope, to take star sightings and input directly the data needed uh, on the computer without need to abandon this uh, station down there. 
The computer was supposed to take inputs and output information from all the systems in the craft. Not only the command module, but also the lunar module, the vehicle that should land on the moon. In this case, uh, this, scheme, this scheme shows you all or at least part of the systems con connected to the computer. You can see from right to left the two propulsion systems, both the uh, braking, the descent uh, engine and the ascent uh, system. The reaction control systems, which were the small jets that move um, laterally and also um, turning around the vehicle. Uh, it took care also, uh, it had to send output to the uh, main panel to uh, control the, all the transmissions uh, to the earth, uh, both, uh, well, mostly data. Uh, handle data from the inertial platform, attitude and acceleration, took information from the optics installed both in the command module and in the lunar module, handled all the information from the landing radar, which of course you can imagine what was it for, just to, to use during the last minutes of the descent to see how, how far the land was, and especially the rendezvous radar, radar sorry, uh, which was supposed to find the uh, main craft when it, they were coming back from the moon, locate the command module and guide the lunar module to the uh, rendezvous with the command one. Well, this is how the AGC, Apollo Guidance Computer, looked. Block one. There were two iterations, block one and block two. Block one never flew. Uh, the second one, yes, uh, it did. Uh, as you can see on the back plane, you can see several plugging connectors, the white ones. Very easy to plug and unplug because at this phase of the design, confidence in computers was so low, perhaps with a uh, hundred uh, hours between failures, that was the standard, that many engineers felt that the, the astronaut should be trained to be able to diagnose failures in the computer and perform fix-ups and even changing boards and, uh, well, acting as a mechanic to keep, to ensure that the computer would work uh, flow, uh, without uh, problems during the whole trip. Of course, this was uh, very soon abandoned, this idea, because first, the uh, astronauts were not computer technicians, second, there was not much time to train them, and third, there wasn't possible to put on board all the set of uh, um, spares and diagnostic equipment that would be needed. This is how the whole system looked. On the left, there was the, the, the main the CPU, to say so, structured in two uh, layers. The top layer had all the memory, uh, uh, the uh, ROM memory, we'll more about that later. And on the right, the uh, user interface itself. The computer uh, was very, very root. Uh, it had to stand not only vibration, but also uh, zero Gs, the corrosive atmosphere of pure O2 in the uh, cabin, so that all the boards, all the components, after being tested and uh, uh, before they were installed in the computer, were uh, embedded in epoxy and rubber to guarantee that the vibrations of the liftoff didn't break any of the very, very thin wires that composed, for instance, the, the memory. On the right is the operation panel. The, there were uh, three of these panels, two, as I told you before, in the common module and one on the lunar module. Or the computer embarked in the common 
or in the lunar model were physically identical except for the programming. The user interface, uh, you can see no mouse, no screen, no, no fancy graphics, no windows, no just a numeric keyboard, some warning lights to the left, and three seven-segment displays, which then were a novelty, uh, were electroluminescent, no LED at all. Um, uh, as I told you, three, <coughs> excuse me, three uh, registers, or three displays that shown the contents of one, uh, three of the registers in the computer. It was felt that three would be enough because at maximum they do, would be needing to read three components of their speed, horizontal, left, right, front, backwards, and up, down. In fact, these registers did much more than this. This is the computer in the inside. Uh, on the left, there is the uh, computer logic, one of the modules of the logic unit, and down uh, with a schematic we, that we will see in a bit of detail later. All the logic, all, well, the computer, the, the Apollo computer was the first computer to make use of integrated circuits that then were a real novelty. So novel that uh, military, the military refused to use them on the uh, miss, uh, missiles because they didn't feel they were trust, uh, uh, capable of being trusted um, during the, the, the heavy duty that they were supposed to resist. Each of these uh, ICs uh, were made by Fairchild, company, the company that invented them, and in each of them there were about six transistors and a few resistors. Each of them contained two logic gates, NOR gates. And they were very advanced because the Block 1 computer was made with the previous generation of ICs, which uh, meant uh, one logic gate per IC. That's the reason for which the ICs used on block one and block two were mm, much more abundant on block one. Uh, I hope you can see it more or less. This probably will bring some nostalgia uh, among some of you. See that all the circuitry, all of it, made use of just one logic gate, the NOR gate in its two uh, varieties, uh, open collector and closed collector, but th this was the only difference. You can identify there quite a lot of flip-flops and uh, some decoding circuit to address the memory, uh, which wasn't easy either. Memory. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the, the clock at which the computer worked was an appealing two megahertz. Just compare it with the uh, mobile you have on your pockets now. It had, uh, if anybody is curious about it, 34 instructions with an instruction cycle of 12 to 85 seconds, 85 for the division, which was something extremely complicated. RAM was two kilowatt. In this case, the computer used words, a 16-bit word, 14-bit uh, data, one parity, and one sign bit with uh, logic in uh, using complement to one, not to two, which also gave them quite a lot of uh, problems, not using complement two, but only one. And the ROM, to call it somehow, were 36 kilowatt, that is 72 kilobyte in modern parlance. The RAM or erasable memory, uh, there wasn't, uh, the, uh, the, didn't exist the word RAM yet, 
was a conventional matrix of uh, magnetic cores, ferrite cores. Uh, so this, this is not the real, the real apology, this is just an illustration. But for those of you who are not familiar, a matrix of uh, ferrite cores were a series of microscopic uh, rings, metallic rings, crossed and crisscrossed, a series of uh, wires that uh, stored one bit every one and stored and erased it just by sending the appropriate current through a matrix, a vertical and a horizontal uh, wire, so that the selected core would, would switch a state, magnetic state, and this switching would be detected with a sense line, but anyhow. The ROM memory was a different thing. I wonder if any of you has ever heard of the, of the term rope memory. ROM was used to store there the program itself, all the routines, all of them. There wasn't a uh, hard disk, there wasn't uh, external memory. Everything had to be here. Uh, and when I mean everything, I mean everything for performing the trip from the Earth to the Moon and back, or to perform the landing from the or lunar orbit and back again. 36 kilowatts. Uh, the programming in a rope memory, uh, rope, uh, sorry, rope memory, was made physically, taking a lot of microscopic cores, which again, I repeat, were almost the only memory available then, and thread microscopic wires through each of them in a certain sequence, which meant that the presence, if the wire went through a ferrite, a core, that meant a one. If the wire skipped the core, that meant a zero. And then let's go to the next one. In other words, the software for the Apollo was not software at all, was as hard as the logic itself. Here, this is uh, the, the one before uh, I told you, well, both of them are, are actual Apollo uh, pictures, but this can give you an idea of how densely packed were the cores with many, many, something like, I don't know if we're 60 or 90 wires through each of them. When you wanted to read a Rome, uh, an Apollo Rome, you had to inhibit all the cores but the one you wanted to read and then send a signal to switch its uh, magnetic state and go to the next core. Uh, on the right uh, here you can see the actual memory, core memory of an Apollo. Uh, it's not very impressive, the, the one, the section at the left, but just look at the hundreds of wires to the right. These wires were threaded, as I told you, physically, by a series of uh, old ladies. Uh, it, the, somebody called this memory the LOL memory, little old lady memory because these were people coming from the textile industry, accustomed to work very precisely and with uh, very small objects, that were given at most, at most <laughs> okay, I'll try to go uh, quickly. Uh, in this case, this, uh, this lady is using a mechanical help to thread the wire on the right core. This is where the uh, computer was located on the main uh, spacecraft, midway between the commander's coach to the left and the uh, pilot on the right, uh, on the center. Again, those were physically 
part of the systems that were, were controlled, as we saw before. The reaction control system, communications, guidance and navigation, and so on. And for those of you who are curious, this is a very simple schematic of how the stellar navigation was made. The, very briefly, the, um, the um, pilot oriented the, uh, the spacecraft until they saw one certain star through the sextant. Then, uh, uh, in a nautical way, moved the, cent the sextant mirror to make the star coincide with a reference on the moon or on the earth or another star, and this gave them the angle between the two of them. Just repeat this uh, procedure two or three times, feed it to the computer, and let the computer do all the matrix, <coughs> matrix and uh, vectorial mathematics which were embedded on the program. This is how the computer looked on the, uh, where the computer was located on the LM between the two astronauts. Again, the systems that were controlled by the uh, HEC in the LM <coughs> and the software that went into the, the computer. This is Margaret Hamilton, one of the head, uh, the uh, directors of development. The developing of uh, Apollo software was grossly underestimated, under uh, considered uh, before. Uh, people somehow thought that the computer, once the hardware was finished, the computer would, would work almost miraculously. Uh, it wasn't so. Hardware took three hundred. Uh, 3,400 person year of effort. Software took almost half of it. Most of the employment, peak employment in the development of hardware was in 1965 with plenty of time. The, play, uh, the peak of employment of, of uh, programmers, 400 in total, was in mid-68, which means that they were just uh, using the last minute they could uh, get hold of. This, I don't think you can see it, but this is the generation of uh, all the programs. Colossus was the name of the program to be used on the main spacecraft, on the command module. Luminaire was on the uh, lunar module. Mm, sorry, but uh, I, I won't get into this. So what was the computer for? Just to give you one example of what, how the computer worked. This is how the landing procedure was made. Three phases. One breaking phase, about eight minutes. Second phase of approach. Uh, and third one of landing itself. This is how the displays in the computer looked. Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to go through them quite quickly. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, you can see where uh, the, the, the first uh, register says landing point targeting, uh, targeting angle. In this case, it's 52. What does 52 mean? The computer kept giving this information to the astronauts when they were about to land. The, the commander had a scale engraved on the window. And the 52 degrees that the computer was saying was the mark on, on the vertical scale to which the computer was taking the lamp to land. Again, 2K, 36 keywords in programming. If everything went well, this, uh, this was the end of the adventure, well, uh, uh, of this part of the adventure, in fact. And, uh, well, let's uh, leave it here. If any of you is uh, very interested, there are lots, lots of documentation on the internet and in, in written. Here you have some of the best books. Don Ailes, for instance, uh, some burst and luminary, was one of the uh, heads of the project, was very much involved from the beginning, and all the rest are rather 
uh, good references, including one, the last one, if you are interested in knowing more, not about the computer itself, but about the Apollo project, in fact. And thank you, thank you very much, and uh, I hope uh, at least has resulted a curious information for you. Thank you. Thank you.